Dear colleagues, dear friends, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to today's event called From Recovery to Prosperity, Transformative Livelihoods and Economic Recovery in Fragile Settings. Um, my name is Luca Renda. I work with UNDP at the Crisis Bureau as a team leader for recovery solution and human mobility. And I will be your host and the moderator of today's discussion. Uh, before I go and introduce the panelists, which are uh, really excellent uh, today and a little bit more into the, the, the topic of today's discussion, let me say that, as, as many of you know, uh, this um, event is part of a broader conversation that UNDP is organizing with a wide range of partners around rethinking solutions to crisis in the decade of action. It's actually a series called Development Dialogues. And the main uh, the, the, the thread that goes through all this discussion in, is how UNDP, as we prepare to formulate a new strategic plan for the next four years, how can we, uh, through our uh, people on the ground, our program and projects, and especially our partnership, um, be uh, more effective in addressing, in deploying, say, development solution in crisis and fragile setting to address root causes, to break the cycle of vulnerability, to achieve transformative changes, to think long term, but from the start, and to use, in, in a sense, uh, crisis as an opportunity for change. Now, this is not easy and not always possible because there's a lot of factors that influence that uh, outcome. But it is our collective duty to try and to keep trying through trials and errors, um, applying methods and analytical tools and with determination, always testing our hypotheses and keeping uh, our learning process alive. Um, in the uh, in the course of, of this uh, development dialogues, which started uh, this month um, and go, will go through June, we have uh, already dealt with a number of topics such as prevention, uh, hate speech, access to justice, women's leadership, COVID-19 and the whole process of recovery, addressing systemic risks. And as I said, we will continue until June with new and very interesting topics, sometimes zooming in a specific region or, or country, um, and always engaging with a wide range of partners. So I will invite all of you to keep um, looking for the agenda of the events and, and tune in. Um, today, um, we will ask some of the same questions that we've been asking um, throughout this process. Um, essentially, the fundamental, i say, most important question is, what is it that we are doing well? And what can we do better? Um, today, we will particularly uh, uh, deep dive on transformative approaches for livelihoods and economic recovery in fragile and crisis-affecting setting. And we will ask ourselves, how can we uh, collectively, of course, we as UNDP, we as United Nations, we as international community, we as collectively, including our partners, on the ground, how can we support countries to identify smart, innovative livelihoods and economic recovery approaches? How do we build livelihood system that help people move beyond recovery towards prosperity? The format of the event is, is divided in three parts. Uh, first, our panelists will provide insights on the theme of recovery to prosperity. Second, we will have a question and answer session. I will be th throwing some questions to the to the panelists. We will also uh, collect questions from the floor. Um, the, the YouTube platform has a chat function, so I um, I invite all the listeners to to put their questions into the into the live chat uh, uh, box. And finally, we will have um, a, a last segment of of reflection uh, and a summary of the key uh, takeaways. I once again want to urge all participants to join in the discussion by tapping questions in the chat box in YouTube. And please 
if you can, include your name, your title, and location. And we will try to collect as many questions uh, as possible. The, the event is also being recorded, uh, so it will be available for those who could not uh, attend today. Let me now introduce uh, our panelists and, and guests. Um, we will have uh, we have three very distinguished speakers today. Uh, in the order in which they will speak, I will introduce them. We have um, my dear friend and colleague Zina uh, Ali Ahmad, who is the UNDP resident representative in Iraq. We have Ambassador Francine Baron, who is uh, the head of the Climate Resilience Execution Agency for Dominica. And we have uh, Matthew uh, Davy, who is the Chief Strategy Officer for Kiva, an organization that works with inclusive finance and, and, and pro providing loans uh, to people who uh, don't normally have access to this. Um, we also have uh, uh, another dear colleague uh, who, with, with us uh, is George Gray, UNDP Chief Economist, who will uh, will be providing the final uh, sort of uh, remarks, conclusion. George, I might even uh, bring you early into the discussion, maybe if you want to ask some questions to our uh, panelists. So uh, with that, uh, I think we can start. Uh, let me uh, introduce uh, the first uh, speaker of today's event. Uh, Zena Ali Ahmad is, as I said, UNDP resident representative in Iraq. Uh, she has had a long and distinguished career at the United Nations. Previously, she was regional director for UN Habitat. She has been UNDP country director in Jordan and Syria. Uh, also, uh, UNDP regional advisor on local governance for Arab state. Uh, a brilliant career, Zena. Now you are heading one of the largest and most complex program of UNDP uh, worldwide. So a very big responsibility, a very large team. Um, so I want to invite you now to share your thoughts on uh, UNDP's integrated approach to livelihoods and economic recovery in Iraq and how this contributes to longer term peace and prosperity. Zena, the floor is yours. Thank you, Luca. Good morning, good afternoon, hello to all uh, our participants and colleagues online. We've had actually the privilege uh, last week also to share our thinking around uh, social and economic development and fragile settings such as in Iraq. And I would like to thank you also for uh, giving us the opportunity now to share our thinking around the issues related to sustainable livelihoods. Maybe uh, maybe we will draw, we hope actually to draw some lessons learned also from the discussion. Uh, we think we're doing well, we're moving forward with an integrated approach, but let me show a very brief presentation which will be followed by a short video and then we can go over for the discussion. So if I may start with the presentation from Iraq, slide one please. Uh, we've seen COVID-19 in, in, in the country unfold over a period of political, social, security, economic turmoil in this country. This has exacerbated the existing crisis. We always say that this is only one crisis over a number of crises. This crisis actually has strained the macroeconomic and fiscal environments in, in, in Iraq. It has also unfolded against a backdrop of conflict with ISIL, years and years of massive de devastation that we've seen in, in this country. We've seen the devaluation of the Iraqi dinar against the US dollars uh, as a result of the multi multiple crises, but also as a result of COVID-19. We've seen that the national poverty line has increased to 31.7% in 2020 compared to 20% in 2018. Unemployment rates have increased. So the official unemployment rate is now around 14%. Youth unemployment is around 25%. And this is only the formal unemployment figures. It does not take into account informal unemployment. We've seen that the most affected in, uh, sectors by COVID-19 are the informal sector 
and daily paid laborers who constitute a majority of the vulnerable workers in this country. We've also seen, as in other countries, many micro and small enterprises close their doors, shut their doors, and we've seen a somehow a depletion of household savings, again, impacting mostly IDPs, women, youth, etc. We need to note that in Iraq, uh, we still have 1.27 million Iraqi people internally displaced and living in, in, in very dire situation, although we've seen uh, almost 4.7 million who have returned back home. We've also seen since the, last of, uh, since the end of last year, the closure of 14 main camps that used to house internally displaced population, which has also created a disruption in services around the country. Next. So UNDP in Iraq has started to work on the sustainable livelihood framework. We wanted actually to graduate from short-term emergency employment generation to sort of medium and longer term approaches where we can create and strengthen the full livelihood cycle. We've been working for a long time now, uh, since mid 2015, on emergency employment through different initiatives like cash for work, et cetera. But we wanted to go beyond so that we can look at innovative ways to actually go uh, forward in terms of uh, sustaining livelihoods. The framework that we've uh, adopted aims, aims at targeting the most vulnerable and the most affected, such as IDPs, women-headed households, youth, uh, unemployed, daily paid laborers, etc. So we've built our approach around needs-based assessments that look at both the structural deficiencies, but also the vulnerabilities, the threats and the risks that face households. We have underpinned our approaches through a conflict sensitive uh, mapping. Any, any place that we go to, any pilot community that we want to work on, we start with a conflict sensitive approach and an assessment so that we can look at the livelihoods creation in a much wider lens. Next, please. So we implement, implement this comprehensive multidisciplinary approach at two main levels. One is at the structural level and another at the operational level. So at the structural level, we've been working at strengthening the enabling environment for private sector development. In Iraq, private sector is nascent. It has been a country that has been controlled by the public sector and remains so. And there is no there is limited, let me say, enabling environment for the private sector to develop, to thrive, to start. So the country has a national committee on private sector development that we provide technical and advisory uh, support to. We've also uh, been supporting the decision making at this committee through a number of surveys on micro and small enterprises, among others. We've also been uh, trying to strengthen policies with the government on economic diversification and promising sectors. Sectors that are economically promising, that have the potential for job creation. Agriculture is one of them, small industrial development and another. And we've also been looking at the competitiveness of the sectors. Again, we are also supporting the access to financing which specifically targets the different credit schemes that would be offered by the government, but also to strengthen the, the services that would be provided by the private bank. So this is all at the at sort of the macro structural level. At the operational level, we've been working on the livelihoods capital for vulnerable Iraqis. We've been trying to strengthen the human assets through employability skills and capacity training, business skills, vocational training, so soft skills, etc. We're combining that with access to financial assets. So access to micro grants for women-headed households, cash for work wages, etc. While doing all of that, we're also trying to strengthen the physical assets uh, so that we can have some, some sort of a full cycle in terms of 
tools and assets to start up the businesses, to restore businesses, rehabilitation of shelter, but also rehabilitation of productive infrastructure. So agricultural assets, basic infrastructure, rehabilitation, markets, access to services, irrigation, water, but also to small factories that can also generate uh, employment. We're working on the social assets through community engagement, consultations with the local leadership, local community-based organizations, authorities. We develop with them the livelihood priorities. We also source uh, youth and women groups to work on reconciliation and social cohesion for reintegration. And we're also working on the natural assets. So we're rehabilitating water canals, we're doing solid waste collection through cash for work projects, etc. We hope that this strategy will benefit also from other program pillars in the new country program document. So through all of this, we were trying to aim to have a holistic, integrated, comprehensive approach to livelihood uh, strengthening in this country. Next, please. Uh, we've, we're working on three uh, distinct pathways towards transformative livelihoods and economic uh, recovery in the country. We would like to ensure that women, youth, persons with disabilities will be central to this transformative livelihood process. So all of our interventions are inclusive and, and participatory to the extent possible, given the security situation also in the country. On the short term, we've been uh, providing income generation and employment through community needs responsive cash for work projects in the different governorates of Iraq and uh, targeting different sectors, such as housing. For example, in this, we've benefited now more than 60,000 beneficiaries, 20% of whom are women with income generating opportunities in, in the different governorates and especially in housing and agricultural rehabilitation. We're also working on the medium to long term uh, issues. So we're working on the market, market and demand driven employment through uh, business skills development, access to finance and toolkits, mentorship. We've already provided around 10,000 entrepreneurs with the basket financing, access to toolkits, mentorship, etc. Another, another uh, initiative is the demand-driven vocational training linked to the private sector so that we can ensure longer, medium and longer term accessibility to employment, where we've worked with more than 8,000 beneficiaries in different areas of the country, approximately 25% of whom are women, so that they can be trained on, on vocations that are required by the private sector on the premise that they would then have an uptake within the private sector companies. We've also zoomed very much to support women-headed households to help them meet their immediate basic needs, also as a result of COVID-19. So more than 1,600 crisis-affected women-headed households received immediate cash injection to meet their basic needs. As I mentioned on the policy and enabling environment support, we're working with the different ministries, so the Ministry of Social Affairs, the national uh, uh, banks, uh, the Ministry of Planning, to do all of, all of the assessments and the studies that would be required so that our approach is underpinned by a strong evidence-based design and, and implementation. As I mentioned, we do conflict development analysis for the pilots before we move into the localities. We've done an extensive socioeconomic impact assessment of COVID-19, we do resilience-based assessments. We also contribute to the humanitarian needs assessments and value chain analysis, etc. Next. We are conscious that if we are to have a real impact in this country, in this fragile country, our interventions have to bridge the humanitarian development and peace nexus. Colleagues who heard me speak last week uh, knew that we, we are advocating for uh, an overall integrated multidisciplinary approach, also that mainstreams national frameworks for peace and social cohesion, and that would advance the role of all the partners. We're also uh, aiming at institutionalizing accessibility 
to livelihoods, especially by the most vulnerable and, and marginalized groups. Next. What do we want to do? We are testing, right? We've been piloting over the last five years. We've impacted uh, a number of people's lives through access to cash, to training, etc. Now we think that we need to move the extra step. And this is why we are working along an integrated framework that would hopefully make together an institutionalized access to sustainable livelihoods. While doing that, we're working on increasing the capacities of all the stakeholders, whether it be at the government or the community-based organizations, the women groups, the peace groups, anyone who can make a difference in improving and having an, an impact, especially on the vulnerable population. Our uh, development solutions are locally led, locally, locally planned, but are also anchored among our assessments that are done at the locality level. We remain uh, there to leverage our experience and knowledge of livelihoods, both in the country, but also regionally and globally, so that we can benefit from the lessons learned that we've seen in other countries, especially fragile countries. Next. Uh, allow me to conclude by showing a very short video on what we think is an excellent impact that we've had through uh, livelihoods and employment uh, initiatives in, in Iraq. Over to you. اشتغل بالمنظمه جزاهم الله خير يعني الحمد لله وشكر هالمنظمه نفعتنا هوايه وطاحت لنا فرصه للشغل الحمد لله والشكر واستفادت من هالمنظمه هوايه استفدت من عندها يعني كوضعنا العشائر يعني ما تسمح للمراه تشتغل بس الحمد لله والشكر هاي كلها تجاوزتها وقدرت اطلع واشتغل واجي الحمد لله والشكر وبشرف اشتغل واجي ان شاء الله وعيش جهالي الحمد لله والشكر على الوضع اللي احنا بيه من شان يقول بزمان اللي اني اذكره احمد الله واشكره اقول هذا من فضل رب العزه اكو ارمله تسعي هسه مثلي اني يعني قبل ما كانت هاي الفرص الارمله لازم انت ترمل تركي نفسها وتقعد تنتظر الصدقات تجيها والصدقات عمرها لا توفي دين ولا تعيش طالب ولا تعيش مره تصير بحراج بحراج بس من فضل رب العزه اللي فتح لنا باب فرصه عمل بهذا المشروع مال يو ان دي بي على اسى اللهم ربي يديم علينا قاعدة السبب من عند الرزق ومو بس الرزق الحمد لله والشكر ربي قاعدة أحصل يعني يعني قمت أقدر أوفي بيه الناس حتى المرأة الأنبارية اللي ربت البيت تقدر تتأمل حياة تقول أكو دنيا ثاري تنفيس أكو دنيا ثاري بيها حياة المرأة تقدر تطلع وتشتغل وتوفر بيها لقمة حلال لجهالها لقمة شريفة بما يرضي الله مو أحسن ما المرأة تقعد وتنتظر الصدقات عمرها وارجع وأقول لك من فضل الله كأنما أنا هسه أحكي لك إياها أقول كأنما دوام رسمي كأنما أنا موظفة رفع معنوياتنا المادية والمعنوية Thank you very much for uh, the opportunity again Luca and colleagues to present this and I hope that this is also an example of how uh, integrated we are trying to work along the uh, sustainable livelihoods framework where we have in my opinion introduced cultural changes to one of the most conservative uh, parts of this country, Ambar. Thanks again, Luca, and over to you. Thank you, dear Zena, for this presentation, for the inspiring video. Uh, a lot to, to learn, a lot to discuss. Uh, we'll come back uh, uh, later in the Q&A session with some, some of the questions, uh, perhaps uh, de de delving a bit more on the, on the aspect of working, as you said, this is locally led. So, uh, how you work with national institution, local institution, how also you coordinate with other actors. Let us now move to the second uh, panelist. It is my real great pleasure to introduce uh, Ambassador 
uh, Francis, Francine Baron of Dominica. Uh, Ambassador uh, Baron is um, a former Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Foreign and CARICOM Affairs of Dominica. She also uh, served as Attorney General um, and High Commissioner for Dominica to the UK. Uh, currently, uh, Ambassador Baron is the head of the Climate Resilience Execution Agency of Dominica, an institution that has been tasked with the development and management of the reconstruction and recovery effort uh, in the country, but especially to promote the vision of Dominica as a climate resilient nation. Um, let me open a small personal parenthesis here. I, Back in 2017, September 2017, Dominica was struck by one of the strongest ever recorded hurricane, Category 5 hurricane uh, in, in the Atlantic. And um, it devastated the island. And uh, I was one of the first to arrive in the island just after the, the catastrophe and had the privilege of spending a few months and just saw how um, the entire nation uh, not only uh, was able to embark on a quick uh, journey to difficult uh, recovery amid the, amidst the, the tragedy and the loss, but also forge a vision for the future, which basically uh, took into account the fact that facing what is really an existential threat caused and aggravated by climate change, how the nation had to embark on a profound transformation that could inspire the rest of the world and become a clim climate resilient island, climate resilient nation. Uh, Ambassador Baron was at the uh, forefront of, of these efforts back there when she was Minister of Foreign Affairs and now at the head of CREED. Um, Ambassador Baron, uh, please uh, thank you for being with us. Can you share your thoughts on the approach taken by CREED to build resilience and tapping into opportunity for the diversification of your economy? Ambassador Baron, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Luca, and thank you to UNDP for uh, inviting me to be part of this discussion this morning. And, and thank you, Luca, for your kind words. Yes, Dominica did go through a very difficult um, period with Hurricane Maria, but we have a clear plan as to how we move forward to build the resilience and become a climate resilient nation. So I'm, I'm going to start this uh, presentation with a few slides. Um, and uh, next slide, please. I, I always, when we, we, we mention the blue economy, I always like to feature our sperm whales. Uh, Dominica has resident sperm whales within its waters and sperm whales are very important as part of our journey to um, becoming more climate resilient. The carbon sequestration that uh, whales bring uh, are an important part of fighting climate change. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? A small island developing states like Dominica experience multiple shocks from extreme rainfall, tropical cyclones, droughts, epidemics like Zika and chikungunya, and economic and price shocks. We are, in fact, among the most economically vulnerable countries to the impacts of COVID-19. There has been a complete disruption of key economic sectors, such as tourism. And this is a, a sector on which many seed economies rely. According to a CDB report, travel and tourism sectors account for more than half of the region's GDP and nearly 40% of employment. And SIDS saw a drop in GDP of 6.9% in 2020 compared to 4.8% in other developing countries. So COVID-19 has had a severe impact on our region. Although Dominica in large measure has successfully contained the health emergency, but recovering from the economic impacts will take us much longer. Uh, next slide. For the recovery process, we have to undertake critical structural economic reforms that are necessary to enhance our resilience, sustainability, and foster economic diversification by unlocking new opportunities that can attract private investment, strengthen resilience, and support the livelihoods of Dominicans. 
In, in Dominica, post COVID, our recovery needs to be blue as well as green. Next slide. We were taking steps before COVID-19 to build resilience in a holistic way. Uh, as Luca just indicated, Hurricane Maria uh, in 2017 devastated the entire island uh, with losses estimated at approximately 226% of our GDP. So there's a significant blow for Dominica. Our response to that was to express a bold vision to become the world's first climate resilient nation. And so in 2018, we developed a national resilience development strategy, which looked at integrating climate resilience and disaster risk management into our national growth and development planning. And with the assistance of some key donor partners, we created the separate government agency responsible for spearheading our recovery and resilience, which is the, the creed. We also developed a climate resilience recovery plan for Dominica, which focuses on building stronger finances, better economic base, resilient infrastructure and communities by 2030. We've targeted 2030 to become climate resilient. Now we've based that plan on three pillars of uh, building resilience, climate resilience systems, prudent disaster risk management, effective disaster risk response and recovery. Uh, our CRRP focuses on six result areas. We're, we're looking at strong, building strong communities, a robust economy, well-planned and durable infrastructure, enhanced collective consciousness, strengthen institutional systems and protected and sustainably leveraged natural and other unique assets. All of these are equally important to ensure that Dominica can deal with shocks that will inevitably increase in the future. Not just climate shocks, but pandemics as we've experienced with COVID-19 and others. Next slide. Dominica might be a small island but it's also a large ocean state. And under our robust economy and sustainably leveraging natural and other unique assets result areas, we have a strong emphasis on promoting the blue economy. So we're looking at economic sectors that either directly or indirectly depend on ocean resources. So we, this includes fisheries, uh, coastal tourism, and this includes as well scuba diving, whale watching, and other such activities. Uh, next slide, please. We have 20 targets under our CRRP that we want to achieve by 2030. And two of those relate to the oceans. Firstly, our target 18 targets achieving 60% of agricultural land cultivated organically by 2030 and a full ban on chemical pesticides in national parks and, and near rivers. We have also implemented a full plastic ban, which uh, as we know, plastics are responsible for um, polluting our oceans and affecting our fishery, fishes in the ocean. So this we expect will massively reduce the amount of pollutants in the oceans that affect our aquatic life. The target 19 is also uh, geared towards increasing healthy coral reef coverage by 50%. And this is to support an increase in our fish stocks and to protect our coastlines and um, our ecotourism industry. Uh, Dominica, as we know, is, is has, operates under the brand of being the nature isle of, of the Caribbean. And so much of our tourism involves people coming to see nature. And we, we want to ensure that we protect that brand. Next, next slide, please. To better plan our activities and promote investment in the blue economy and the better use of our ocean resources, Dominica partnered with the OECS in developing a coastal master plan and a marine spatial plan for Dominica. This looks at integrating ocean planning to ensure that Dominica 
takes full advantage of the opportunities of the blue economy. So we want to ensure that our fishing cont continues to be sustainable and that our coastal areas are used optimally for tourism and conservation. We think it very important that we, we use the ocean resources in a sustainable manner. Currently, less than 0.1% of our territorial waters are protected. And we want to significantly increase marine protected areas that will ultimately result in better fish stocks while preserving uh, the, the environment. Next, plan, next, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, Dominica's economy depends in a large part upon the ecosystem services provided by our coral reefs and their watersheds. And efforts are on the way to carry out a systematic assessment of our coral reefs to restore and manage the, the coral reefs, looking at our seagrass beds and how we can monetize them for ecosystem services, for larval fish development in uh, the north of our island in, in Portsmouth, which in turn would lead to healthier deep water fish. Next slide. So we, to, to support our diversification, um, and uh, into the, the blue economy. We want to develop a blue economy investment fund. Uh, that fund would support the development of viable and sustainable businesses that are based on or linked to Dominica's rich marine environment. So we want to tap into the private and social sector investment so that we steer it towards a commercial or quasi-commercial ventures that will support Dominica's overall climate resilience ambition. Uh, there, there, there are a number of these initiatives that are new or in the pipeline, and there's still a lot that we have to do to turn the, these ambitions into reality. The coastal master plan and marine spatial plan that we have developed looks at how best we can um, integrate development of our marine resources and develop a, a, a clear plan as to how uh, we can uh, diversify our economy by investing in developing our blue economy. Uh, slide, the next slide, please. Uh, in summary, investing in the blue economy can help Dominica become more resilient to external shocks in the future. Because importantly, it, it provides a very good avenue for us to diversify our economy. And one of the clear strategies for us in our CRRP is developing a robust economy, an economy that can, can weather uh, climatic and other shocks. So that in the event we are faced by a disaster, we are faced by a pandemic, we are able to, to survive because our economy has been diversified uh, sufficiently to allow us to continue to have um, uh, uh, income coming in from various sources. So the, the potential for us to diversify our income by looking to the ocean to, um, to enhance our livelihoods is critical, uh, not only from the point of view of the potential for fisheries, but also the coastal activities, our whale watching um, and, and diving and, and other activities along that, along that um, area. Uh, we also, it's also important for increasing food security, and that is key. Uh, one of the challenges that we saw coming out of COVID-19 was uh, the, the challenge for food production since in many countries uh, they, they went into lockdown um, and this had an impact on um, food production. So um, the, the development of our blue economy increases our food security, our ability to be able to provide for ourselves and to export. Uh, it also look, assist with enforcing a more sustainable tourism model where we, we focus on more targeted 
tourism, where there's less people spending more time for a specialist experience. It also supports as well preserving our bi biodiversity and natural barriers to climate shocks uh, by um, securing our coral reefs and mangroves. Importantly, the development of marine protected areas are critical to en ensure that we look at preserving and sustaining the, the resources of the ocean and ensuring that we have for future generations um, that they are able to, to uh, benefit from and enjoy the same resources that we enjoy uh, right now. So um, we are looking at the development of the blue economy in a holistic way. Uh, the, we're in the process of developing a blue economy strategy that takes into account Dominica's uh, goal to become um, climate resilient and um, approach it in a, in a sustainable, su sustainable manner. So thank you very much uh, for your um, attention today and um, for allowing me to share some of what Dominica is doing uh, in, in its quest to become a climate resilient nation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Baron, for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation, very inspiring presentation. Certainly a, a, a complex journey towards resilience that involved different institutions, different you know, strategies, sectoral strategy, and even, even I, I, I want to highlight a change, I, as we mentioned, a collective consciousness, shifting the perception from being a small island to a large ocean state with uh, uh, this uh, resource that uh, that is yours and that uh, can be uh, leveraged and tapped into to to make your economy stronger, more resilient, and uh, and diversified. So a lot to learn from, and I I have to say, Dominica has become uh, uh, an example and, and a beacon for many other countries in terms of. Uh, elaborating a, a, a such an ambitious um, strategy. We'll go back to some of the issues that you mentioned later. Um, in particular, I, I know that you're not only um, investing on, on, on blue economy, you're also making a strong investment on, on digital transformation. So okay. maybe it would be good to, to hear a little bit about this uh, later on during the Q&A session. Thank you. Now let's go to our third panelist. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Matthew Davy, um, who is um, uh, Chief uh, Strategic Adv uh, Officer for Kiva. Uh, he joined Kiva in 2008 to focus on long-term strategic initiatives to help drive systemic financial inclusion for the world's most vulnerable population. He oversees corporate strategy, emergency technology development, and policy and regulatory environments. Um, he has also spent, prior to Kiva, over a decade, work, wo decade working on uh, multinational technology companies in big data, environment, and the gaming sector as well. Matthew, welcome. Um, it is uh, a pleasure for us to have you uh, here. We, we heard the voice of, of a, a, a colleague in the field running a, multi, uh, a very complex, one of the largest program in the world. We heard from uh, at the head of a, of, a, of a reconstruction and recovery agency in, in, a, in, a, in a country that is aspiring to become uh, climate resilient. We're now hearing from another kind of organization, another entity, uh, also with the global reach though, um, that is Kiva. Uh, Matthew, uh, can you share a, a bit about Kiva's work on advice, advancing financial inclusion in fragile contexts, uh, recognizing that financial inclusion is as a critical part of inclusive and resilient livelihood system. Matthew, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm just gonna talk briefly about some of Kiva's experiences providing access to finance in fragile contexts, our lessons learned, and what we see as opportunities going forward. So if we can hit the next slide, please. So quickly, for those who don't know, Kiva is an international nonprofit organization. We've worked over the past 15 years to provide access to finance to un- and underbanked individuals in over 90 countries around the world. And we have three primary impact lines. First is Kiva.org. It's our crowdfunding marketplace that most people know us for. Um, financial service providers often have less incentive to engage with and serve fragile communities because of the higher onboarding costs and uncertain economic returns. 
And so Kiva.org offers flexible, very risk tolerant capital, technical assistance and other capacity building support that allows financial service providers to experiment, build new initiatives and then learn from them. Through Kiva.org, we're able to test and challenge assumptions about who is credit worthy and then demonstrate to the ecosystem that communities that are perceived as you know, inherently risky, such as refugees, have repayment rates that are substantially similar to the broader population. I like to think of this crowdfunding marketplace as our tip of the spear. It helps enable financial service providers to lend to vulnerable populations that they otherwise might avoid, mitigate their perceptions of risk, and reduce their cost of service. Then these institutions can start scaling their services to these populations, and the crowdfunded capital can move on to the next underserved community. Now, our second impact line is Kiva Capital. It's our new fund manager impact line. If you think back at or zoom back at global financial inclusion, it's a multi-trillion, trillion with a T, dollar problem. And so this isn't going to be solved with crowdfunding or retail vehicles alone. Institutional capital needs to flow to underserved markets. So about two years ago, we set out to build a fund management impact line to prove that this works. Instead of trying to go and convince institutional fund managers that there's return in these markets and good yield, it's still a bridge too far for most of them. We decided we would just show our work and do it ourselves in an effort to catalyze the broader ecosystem of institutional investors. Some of our initial funds target highly vulnerable populations. The first one we started um, is the Kiva Refugee Investment Fund. It's a $30 million vehicle that over the next five years will provide microfinance institutions with one to $3 million loans so they can scale their efforts to offer financial services in the context of globally forced migration. Another one is the Small Business Resilience Fund. This is a $26 million fund that we put together with Google to invest in Africa, the Middle East, and Indonesia to help support pandemic recovery efforts in financial services. Additionally, that vehicle has a million dollar technical assistant grant from Google so that we can provide technical assistance and research the impact of this program. And so by becoming a fund manager with Kiva Capital, you know, we do hope to scale our funds to provide more impact, but very importantly, we wanna demonstrate the return potential to other institutional fund managers so that long-term that ecosystem of capital is available to serve these populations. And third is Kiva Protocol. Um, it's our efforts to enable digital financial inclusion efforts at scale. So again, a few years ago, about three years ago, we stepped back to look at the broader systemic barriers to financial inclusion. And with all the efforts going to serve underserved populations, we asked the question, why aren't we seeing more individuals and families and communities entering the formal financial sector? And when you start peeling back the layers of this question, it really comes down to a three-pronged problem. There's lack of account ownership. Oftentimes that's predicated by lack of digital access and lack of identity. And really the lack of verifiable identity is the atomic unit. And since we wanna make sure we're building solutions for tomorrow, we really focused on digital identity, not analog identity as the last mile is digitizing. And so these efforts became what is now Kiva Protocol. And if you go to the next slide, I'll, I'll dig a little bit deeper on Kiva Protocol. So zooming in on protocol for a minute, I tend to describe it as a foundational digital public good that can help bridge the gap that exists between the public and private sector when it comes to consumer finance. It's a decentralized, secure, and open source digital identity platform that enables individuals to access formal financial services in a fast, cheap, and secure way. And we believe that long term, it will help capital flow to the world's most vulnerable populations alongside digitization of that last mile. So why does this matter to us and why do we think it matters to financial inclusion? Well, the most excluded communities, including women, refugees, smallholder farmers and youth, have this systemic barrier, verifiable identity. If they can't provide the right documentation, they cannot open an account and these financial service providers tend to be blocked from serving them. Protocol creates the infrastructure for a human-centric citizen or resident-owned identity that can be foundational to help access financial services, open an account. But not just that, it also then provides the foundations for other sectors that are digitizing at the same time in these fragile contexts. Importantly, we're using decentralized technology, which places individuals in control of their data and removes resilience on centralized institutions, because these are often absent in vulnerable communities. And the system very importantly allows for offline verification and multi-user devices because we want to make sure that a lack of internet connectivity and a lack of device ownership doesn't further exacerbate the existing digital divide. In terms of our status, the first live implementation of protocol is the national digital identity platform in Sierra Leone. In the country, it provides near universal coverage for all adults. 
And just for context, before this was implemented, an EKYC, a know your customer verification to open a bank, open a bank account or a savings account, took two weeks or more and cost $1.40 US. And that's only if an individual was able to produce the requisite paper documentation. Now, it takes 10 seconds, costs less than 10 cents, and uses just a, a consumer's fingerprint to open an account. So over the next five years, what we're hoping is to add five to seven new population scale implementations and hoping we can create a pathway to financial inclusion for over 250 million individuals. If we do this, we'll be able to prove viability in diverse socioeconomic contexts and provide models, knowledge, and tools to incentivize other countries to adopt similar technologies in their own contexts. We're also planning to add functionality that's foundational to broader financial ecosystem efforts, such as transaction reporting so someone can start to build a credit history, and support for payments, especially social protection payments. Just imagine everyone, even the most vulnerable, having fast, cheap, and secure access to receive their social protection payments and the ability to withdraw it into fiat at any financial institution, regardless of whether they've opened an account there or not. This is all possible over the next decade if technology is implemented in kind of a, a vulnerable centric uh, methodology. And so through expansion, we hope to enable ecosystems of service providers to better serve the currently excluded. If you go to the next slide, please. Okay, so one more slide really quickly on the fragile context where Kiva works. So over the past 15 years, we've worked in 94 countries, including many of the most vulnerable. And by improving access to capital, individuals, families, and communities are more able to lift themselves out of poverty. And so this slide highlights just a few countries. In Nicaragua, for example, we provided 36 million of economic support to provide support and flexibility to the No Pago movement in 2009 and the recent political unrest and civilian protests in 2018. In Democratic Republic of the Congo, we provided $29 million to support financial service providers during political instability and during the Ebola outbreak. And in Lebanon, we've had 36 million to support local small business owners, especially Syrian and Palestinian refugees. Next slide, please. So what are the actions we hope to see coming out of these experiences? Well, for Kiva, working in fragile contexts over the past many years, we've learned valuable ways of engaging with local communities that can be scaled to build a more inclusive and resilient future. First, we have some lessons around managing COVID-19 and unex unexpected shocks. And this pandemic underscores the importance of building long-term, resilient, and flexible infrastructure that can weather unpredictable events. As an example, through our partnership with the MasterCard Foundation, we've been increasing technical assistance to help financial service providers understand how they can better serve vulnerable borrowers. We've also worked on liquidity and concurrent capacity building measures, as these are especially critical in fragile contexts where local communities face a lack of access to financial resources and assistance. Second, focusing on borrowers' voices. Understanding, understanding and addressing borrower concerns is incredibly important. We continue to actively collect feedback on programs and services to influence organizational decision-making and create new offerings and to work closely with borrowers to identify barriers to access and tailor financial products to local communities. And finally, building up digital ecosystems. Especially in fragile contexts, digital infrastructure can play a critical role in expanding who has access to financial products and services. We will, over time, continue to prioritize investments in digitization of last mile financial access, as we see this as a massive pathway to enabling an ecosystem approach to financial inclusion at scale. And we like to encourage others to find flexible technical partners who can incorporate client voices into their products and services, increasing the usability and relevance in the local contexts. And again, financial inclusion, this is a massive global ubiquitous problem. We're happy to be an enabling part of the solution, but we really hope that our efforts and experiences can provide leverage to a broader ecosystem approach to this challenge over the next decade. Next slide, please. Great, uh, and thank you for joining me. I know this was just a quick look under the hood at Kiva's experiences. I'll happily take questions later, and I really just hope that Kiva's efforts over the past 15 years can provide some leverage to everybody who's listening and to your organizations as we work together to build a more inclusive, resilient future for everybody. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, congratulations to, to you and the, the Kiva team for this uh, remarkable uh, work that you're doing to to, to increase financial inclusion, and, the, and we know practitioners on the ground know how you know that the, the giving in financial access to people is one of the the, the key uh, you know uh, elements for success 
but it's also uh, uh, very difficult because of the uh, preconditions that exist. Some of them are not uh, banked. They don't have access to bank account. They don't have the digital means, etc. But uh, you found a way, and you, uh, and particularly this, this, this focus on digital ID is, is extremely interesting. And by the way, um, just uh, to inform our, our viewers that you know, UNDP and Kiva are in talks uh, to develop a partnership, and we hope that with this can uh, can happen. Uh, very soon. Let me now uh, go to uh, 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 the Q&A session. Uh, we did receive some questions from the floor. Uh, I encourage you to put more questions uh, in the uh, minutes that are remaining. Um, I will start with, with Zena. There, there are two questions, Zena, that are coming from, uh, uh, from the floor. One uh, from uh, uh, Rima uh, and uh, the other one from... Uh, no, anyway, there are two questions. Zena, uh, first question is, uh, do you think the donors have to, uh, thank you, this is Rima from, from Somalia, yes. Do you think the donors have too short a funding horizon in, in Iraq uh, in relation to projects that are working on the uh, moving from short term uh, to long term impact and in particular, uh, as this is relevant for what we talk about is the nexus between humanitarian development and work. This is one question. So how you address the fact that sometimes donors tend to have a short term horizon, tend to privilege activities that are more uh, short term. And the second question is, how do you, does your program meet uh, the specific livelihoods of um, refugees? Well, particularly IDPs in Iraq internally displaced and, and, in, and you build the basis for their the durable solution, meaning their integration in, in, the, in the place where they live or resettlement in the place of origin or other kinds of solution. Um, over to you, Zena. Try to be uh, concise uh, to allow for more questions later. Thank um, you, Luca. And thank you very much for the colleagues who have posed questions. This is exactly the engaging space that we would like rather than only giving presentations. Uh, Rima, I don't know whether, uh, thank you for a very pertinent question. I don't know, I don't know whether you were with us on the launch of, uh, of the Fragility Week. Uh, actually, we have published a, a thought piece uh, last week to look with a call, let me say, to our partners, but also to our donors to look at the multidimensional approaches so that we can put fragility at the center of recovery efforts especially in countries like Somalia or Iraq or other countries that are fragile. Uh, actually, part of this calling was to our donors and development partners so that they can also take into consideration a holistic, comprehensive, integrated view that takes into account political, security, societal, economic, environmental threats and vulnerabilities. Because if we, as UNDP, are doing, are trying to do that, and we are in Iraq, however, we cannot do it without the support and the strategic partnership and the funding streams that would allow us to work across the humanitarian and the development and the peace uh, continuing. We have, uh, we have put forward also a recommendation in our short policy note for donors to adopt this approach. Uh, I mean, let me give an example. Uh, we're working uh, on issues that are related to stabilization. We've had excellent support from our international community and from our donors. But now we're trying to move a little bit into an integrated approach. And we would like the funding stream, especially not only Iraq is not only a fragile country, it's also a high middle income country. So the sort of the traditional funding that comes for development is not suited for Iraq. A lot of humanitarian funding and a lot of stabilization funding has come. So in short, yes, uh, we are calling on the donors to have a longer term integrated funding packages that look at fragility also at the center. And for the colleague uh, on the needs of uh, the refugees, Again, I mean, we're putting uh, livelihoods at the center of what we're doing in this country. Specific livelihood needs. Yes, I mean, again, as I said, we're working very much on livelihoods creation and employment generation. 
we've uh, built uh, infrastructure and basic services in areas that have been devastated by ISIL. However, people will not come back if they do not have a source of livelihoods in these areas. And this is where we have integrated our livelihoods very much so in the areas of return so that they can encourage people to come back. In terms of uh, pilot uh, projects on uh, very, very sensitive issues like uh, ISIS perceived affiliated families, again, we're giving what we're calling a peace dividend so that we can combine the humanitarian development and peace uh, issues together through uh, livelihoods uh, for reintegration. And uh, the same goes for refugees, although it's a bit more uh, more problematic, I have to say, in terms of uh, reintegration. But for IDPs, it has been an excellent incentive for IDPs to return back to their communities. I hope that I have answered the questions, Luca. Thank you very much, uh, Zena. Um, uh, we are still receiving questions also for you. Let's see if we have time for further questions later on. Uh, Ambassador Baron, let me uh, go to you now with um, a couple of questions. Um, we have a question from the floor um, from uh, our colleague uh, Aparna. Uh, no, sorry, Apurba. Um, so the first question is, First of all, great strategy, Ambassador Baron. That's the first uh, uh, comment. How does your country ensure that the planetary boundary is respected while exploring the blue economy? In, in other words, how do you make sure that you are actually uh, within the, uh, the the sustainability of the of the of the resources that uh, nature has provided you? And the second question is, uh, going back to the comment uh, I made before, uh, is uh, I, I, we know that Dominica is making a, a huge investment also on digitalization. And if you can spend a, f a few minutes talking about that, because in UNDP, uh, we have developed a, a, a strategy to support uh, SEEDS, small island development states, and two of the components are it's precisely the, the blue economy, and, and the other one is, is tr you know, economic transformation going also towards uh, digital transformation. So it'll be interesting to hear also the effort mm -hmm. that your country is making on this. Over to you, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Luca. And in, in relation to the first question, uh, we started off by first engaging in a scoping study to look at what are the resources that we have? What are the uses that we're making of the resources? And then developing a, a, a coastal and a master plan and marine spatial plan to look at how ca can we uh, approach the um, exploitation of our resources in a sustainable way. Uh, part of what we're developing at this point in time is a blue economy strategy. Because we want to make sure that we, we use the resources uh, responsibly. We have two marine protected areas currently, and we want to expand that significantly because it's only about 0.1% um, of our marine um, space that, that is protected. So we want to expand the number of areas, marine protected areas that we have uh, to ensure that there's protection. But additionally, it will also lead to um, greater species uh, of fish in our um, waters as well. Uh, and uh, there, there will be a proper plan in terms of how we engage in um, exploiting the fish, our fish reserves. Um, we're, we're also looking at um, looking at our our whale watching um, and uh, developing of the potential uh, that the whales bring, where we're, we'll be undertaking very shortly a project that will be studying more closely uh, the whales in our waters and um, how we can protect them and, and ensure their longe longevity. longevity. Um, and so it, we're, we're looking at it in a holistic way to make sure that we are we we and we ensure that our practices are um, not going to deplete the reserves that we have within our marine space. We're also looking at uh, reducing marine pollution as well, 
So as I indicated earlier, um, on the banning of plastics and the reduction and elimination of the use of chemical pesticides close to um, uh, rivers and um, close to the coastline so that you can, um, you, you, you can protect the, the health of um, your marine species. We're also developing uh, um, a plan to look at how we can uh, protect the reefs coral reefs that we have and grow more coral reefs um, to improve the, 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 uh, the marine space. Uh, on, the, on the second question in, re in relation to the digital economy, we are currently undertaking a, a major digital economy project uh, with the support of the World Bank. Uh, I think COVID-19 particularly showed the need for us to, uh, to to be more invested in the digital economy. Uh, for for many of us, when we went through the period of lockdown and um, re, uh, social distancing and the other protocols that we had to follow as a result of COVID-19, uh, many of our services were, were, had to go online. Uh, and so we have been um, working on getting all government services to be online so that people are able to access government services uh, through, 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 through the internet that they can pay online. We're looking at creating a, a structure um, uh, to, to ensure that we, are, we manage data properly and we ensure that people's, um, that, that their security in the use of um, online transactions uh, we're looking at the opportunities available in the gig economy uh, for online jobs, uh, which is very important. It's part of our, our um, move towards diversifying our economy by uh, um, being able to, uh, to, to, be, to get engaged in jobs that are available uh, across the world. Uh, we're also looking at uh, uh, encouraging persons to... To, to take advantage of uh, the ability to work online and to, to relocate, relocate to Dominica and work in nature from Dominica uh, uh, because we, we have been able to, to manage the COVID epidemic uh, uh, very well. Uh, so we're, we're looking at different aspects of um, the digital economy and um, uh, education is a very large aspect of it, uh, bringing all of the population on board with uh, uh, being familiar with how to um, take advantage of the, the, the internet and, and access the various services that are avail available online. It's, um, it's a very involved project uh, that will, will, will take um, a, a few years to fully realize, uh, but we, we want at the end of the period to have fully diversified into the digital economy and take advantage of the, of the services that are available and the opportunities. Thanks, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, really a lot to learn from, from Dominica and we, we look forward to, to continue to be your partner in all, all these efforts um, through our office uh, in Roseau and, and, and our teams. Um, let me go to Matthew. We, we try to be quick. There's a lot of questions that are coming in. So Matthew, a couple of questions for you. Um, first of all, uh, a, a, a broader question on how, um, how you, is your strategy to work with, level, uh, with governments and at policy level to advance your agenda? Um, and the second is about privacy. Uh, how do you manage to protect the information of people registered in the platform? Does this have a cost for beneficiary? beneficiaries? Is the platform sustainable yet? Great questions. You, if you can you know, provide an uh, answer within just a couple of minutes, that would be great. Matthew, over to you. Perfect. I will do my best to keep it short. Um, on the working with government question, um, I'll zoom in on Kiva protocol, that enabling, like trying to close the gap between the public and private sector. And when you think about financial inclusion, governments want financial inclusion. They want financial services. I mean, you can think in light of the pandemic, they really want to be able to deliver social protection payments to all the beneficiaries. And the ones who need it the most tend to be the ones who are most excluded. 
So what they're doing right now is working a lot on writing policies that will help enable a risk-based approach, help, help serve vulnerable populations, try to reduce the cost. And the private sector wants to serve them. The problem is often it's either non-compliant to serve them, so they need a regulatory or policy change, or it's too expensive, like just do it, the account opening process and going through compliance is too expensive. What we believe one of the missing ingredients is, is kind of the technical corollary to those regulatory engagements and those policy engagements. And so while we don't advise on policy, we don't see that as our job, we try to work with enabling policy environments to show what is possible. Hey, if you look at a risk-based approach, maybe a lower value account opening doesn't need as much documentation and you can set some account limits of five or 10 or $50. And you know, even an account that can only store up to $50 and can only transact five or $10 at a time, that could be transformational um, for remittances, for social protection payments and a litany of other things. And so on our engagement with governments, we're really looking at how do we help close that gap? The governments want these social protection payments and this inclusive finance to happen and the private sector wants to serve there's just this missing middle that we're trying to help fill in. And we try to bring some techno expertise, open source technology, TA support to that party. Um, on data protection, I'll stick on the identity side. We believe as you look at the digitization of the last mile, it's really important to think about safeguarding user agency and choice. And I think a lot of what we're dealing with with data protection around the world is because fundamentally, when we transact and have data online, it's not actually our data. It's owned by whatever company is storing it and they decide how to use it. And I think GDPR and all of the other data protection initiatives out there are trying to solve that and trying to remedy that. When we build technology, so when we build Kiva protocol, this is why we chose decentralized technology. So if a user receives a national digital ID into, into a digital wallet, even Kiva can't decrypt that. It's encrypted using a private encryption key only for that individual and only that individual can unlock that data. And so if you go back to like, what's the root of data protection? It's, it's my data. I want to choose when it gets shared. This is a technology or a technical infrastructure in a way of thinking of architecting it that actually walks that walk. You actually, I mean, you should have all of the policies and frameworks in place, all the data protection in place also. But technically, if Kiva wanted to share a user's identity information, which we don't, but if we did, we couldn't do it. I cannot decrypt and access that user's wallet. Only they can decrypt and use it. And that's really, really powerful. If you think about a refugee context and someone or forcibly displaced person who has to flee and wants to make sure their, their data is not gonna be used against them, it can't unless they're gonna thumbprint in if it's biometric authentication, unless they're gonna personally authenticate in and decrypt that information. And these are kind of leapfrogging a lot of the challenges that we see in the developed world. And we hope that emerging economies and vulnerable populations as they get digitized, that we can learn from what's happened over the last 35 years in technology and actually implement better systems. And I'll pause there. Thank you, Matthew. I'm sure a lot of our colleagues uh, in the field are thinking, hey, this is really the kind of uh, partnership we need. This is the, the, the kind of uh, uh, you know, platforms and and, and, and expertise that we need to, to strengthen our operations. So um, clearly there, there's a lot of ground that we can cover uh, together in the future. Uh, we have time for another round of question. If you promise to uh, give uh, you know, short <laughs> answers, but the questions are not so easy. So let me go again to, to, to Zina, uh, a question from uh, Gemma from Reach. Uh, what uh, did needs assessment, what role did needs assessment play in the construction of UNDP framework and how will integrated needs plus context monitoring guide implementation? Um, and the second question is, um, what steps are in place in Iraq to engage the private sector in job creation? And you so want me how, to be brief? How, how you managed to <laughs> answer in two minutes? I don't know, but I know you can. Okay, let me take one minute on each, and then, uh, I mean, we can, we can, if there's any more time, we can go ahead. On the private sector, very briefly, there is a national private sector strategy that we've supported the government to put in. However, the implementation is lagging, I have to say, because the, the country, due to all the crisis and, and COVID-19 has delayed some of these, was not able to put forth a lot of governance reforms, structural reforms that are needed to enhance investment. The IFIs, the international financial institutions, 
are working very much with the government to try to provide loans, etc., to the big private sector companies. UNDP and other partners are trying to support the micro and small and medium enterprises to be able to do that. So we're working very much on the enabling environment along with the partners, but we are also working on the bank guarantees. And here I'd love to uh, have a bilateral discussion with Kiva also on how to work on financial inclusion. So that's one minute. Uh, on the on Gemma's question on the needs assessment, uh, we've done a, a holistic approach to be able to look at what uh, a mapping, let me say, on what other partners are doing in terms of livelihoods uh, and sustainability, sustainable livelihood creation. We've devised our own assessments. So, for example, in COVID, we've published a policy assessment on the impact of COVID on micro and small enterprises and, and other uh, issues related to economic development. We have to, whenever we want to go and pilot the approach in one of the communities, we do a livelihoods assessment that is specific to the community because we believe that everything is local and locally driven and, and, and locally contextualized. So we do an impact assessment, an assessment of the livelihoods opportunities. We look at the promising sectors. We look at the private sector and who is, uh, who is interested and able to work with us, for example, on an uptake of business scale uh, training, et cetera. So our, uh, our assessments are both at the national level and these are published, but we also do a lot of pilot assessments so that it can drive our programming at the local level. Uh, the context monitoring guide implementation, uh, we have a very robust monitoring system uh, that goes, again, very, very local. I mean, on stabilization programming alone, the Iraq implements around 2,200 projects together that uh, track the number of beneficiaries, etc. We also use third-party monitors and we use our own field monitors. So there are a lot of layers for monitoring. And on evaluation, we should be much better in terms of the evaluations guiding our uh, uh, programming, but we try to do so. I hope I was short uh, and brief, Luca. Thank you, Thank you. Zena. I realize that answering uh, two questions at the time uh, is challenging given the short time, but you did very well. Ambassador Baron, I will pose one question to you that is coming from the floor. Um, in the framework of the blue economy, are you planning to deliver green loans to uh, mi micro, small and medium uh, enterprise to support their recovery? Yeah, thank you, Luca. I'll be brief as well. Uh, just to indicate that the, the challenges that the MSMEs face in uh, Dominica, and I think it's probably the same for in, in, in many um, small island developing states, is being able to access finance. Uh, and um, we are working with partners in terms of being able to mobilize some resources that can be made available to MSMEs, particularly to encourage them uh, to um, engage in green practices and invest in uh, sustainable practices in their businesses. Uh, technical support as well is, is, is critical. Uh, um, we in Creed, for example, have been providing some um, assistance to MSMEs in terms of financial management, uh, critically to get their books in order so that they can access the financing that may be available. So certainly uh, there, we, we are exploring the opportunities for um, being able to support MSMEs in being able to access green loans. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. One final question for you, Matthew. Um, some perceive more risk in lending or investing in fragile contexts. How does Kiva work with the risk or, and the risk perception? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, at Kiva, we find it's really important to separate real risk from perceived risk, especially within fragile context, contexts. Um, risk understanding and risk management, they're really core to Kiva's backend operation, and they consist of rigorous due diligence and monitoring processes, which are validated through systematic and on-site verification. So overall, we try to strike a fine balance between operating in higher risk contexts, whether we're talking about locations or products or clients, while keeping a fiduciary responsibility to our lenders. And we feel that over the past 15 years, we've really addressed the perceived risk issue, given our pre-COVID borrower repayment rate was 98%, which is really on par with US credit card default. So at a macro level, 
I think we've helped debunk the myth that the underserved and unbanked are inherently a poor credit opportunity. Now on a more micro level, we work with our global network of local lending institutions to help them test and overcome their own perceived risks and biases. An example I like to use is lending to border populations in Cambodia for buying water filters. A long time ago, this was perce a perceived risk that border populations, they would get the loan, they'd buy a water filter, and then they'd hop the border and leave the lending partner with no recourse because they're out of the jurisdiction now. Um, and with our really risk tolerant capital, we're able to go, we, we were able to go to these lending providers and provide basically risk-free lending to them. Kiva's lenders assume the risk of default. And guess what? The repayments were great. And now these lending partners can lend to these border populations and they do without the Kiva partnership because we've helped remove that perceived risk. And so like, I really think this uh, holistic and open approach has really been the primary driver to our success when we talk about lending in fragile contexts. We really like to be the tip of the spear to help show market viability and then spur an ecosystem approach. Thank you, Matthew. Um, great. Uh, I want to thank our panelists for uh, for their intervention, for for answering so many questions. It is now. Uh, let's now move to the third uh, part of this event. I want to bring in now uh, my dear friend and colleague George Gray Molina, who is the uh, chief economist of UNDP. Um, and the reason why we, we asked George to be part of the event is also to show that, you know, when we talk about moving from uh, recovery to prosperity, it's also uh, different parts of, of UNDP that need to, to work. It's a, what we call a whole of UNDP uh, approach. Just as governments have to adopt a, a whole of government approach or partners on the ground has, have to work together. Uh, moving from short-term, immediate res, uh, relief or... or uh, medium term recovery, but thinking into in terms of economic transformation, in terms of changes that are structural in nature and that can have to do with regulation, with institution, uh, with protocols, even with com com collective consciousness, as Ambassador uh, Baron uh, put it. So George, you have um, you've been at the forefront uh, of UNDP's intellectual work, but also uh, for example, in all the uh, strategy that UNDP put in place to support countries recover, uh, addressed in you know immediate uh, response to uh, COVID-19, but also to elaborate a recovery strategy, you've been uh, uh, one of the brains behind the UNDP sort of COVID uh, you know offer, um, and uh, and you are now working on the conceptualization of the strategic plan. So. Um, I want to uh, ask you now to, to give us your uh, reflection based on what you have listened and based on your experience. Um, so to give us concluding remarks and some um, uh, uh, indication for the way forward, uh, I will then uh, uh, take the floor once more to close the event. Over to you, George. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. Thank you for that kind introduction, but also thank you for inviting me to this event. I think that what we heard in the last three presentations and in the question and answer is a very rich discussion. It's something that allows us uh, to reframe some of the ways that we think about recovery and economic recovery in particular. Let me start with an observation which I find to be uh, very pertinent is that in times of COVID, we're, we're accustomed to thinking of recovery as if it was a V-shaped recovery, a, a Nike swish, something that rebounds. And I think all three presentations have told us that that's probably not the right way to look at this. It's probably best to think about moving from one equilibria to some other equilibria. And that equilibria is based on an enabling environment that many have talked about, but also about capabilities and assets. And, you know, something that economists, we economists, we call that a, a sample selection bias, but a cactus in the desert problem. So we want to focus on the cactus, but it's not good enough to make better cactuses we also have to change the ecosystem for, for there to be other plants and other trees. So let me make just three comments on enabling environments, on capabilities and assets, and then move to the tricky one, which is structural transformation and the path beyond recovery. I think in, 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 the, in the big picture, when we think about the enabling environment and, and we think of non-conflict, non-crisis, non-fragile settings, we usually think of three things. We think of the labor market that's working, the social assistance that is in place, and the social insurance mechanisms that provide mitigation for idiosyncratic risk. Uh, I think what we just heard 
right now is that that imagery is, is also probably wrong in this case because many of the markets are missing for the labor market, for their social protection, for the social insurance. So as we think about making markets in the way that Mazzucato thinks about making markets, which is not uh, just inviting the price system to work, but actually to craft the institutions, to use the policies, to regulate, to create uh, the boundaries within risk uh, are manageable for small and medium enterprise. I think that's what we heard right now. I love the the example, and I'm very inspired by the example from Iraq on uh, going through gender barriers to create a market, to create a market for women organized in small and medium enterprises in a very fragile context. I think the same uh, example is also very inspiring coming from Dominica and Ambassador Barron's uh, coastal uh, master plan, because I think the idea of thinking through what is the enabling environment that, that will allow us to push through is very forward-looking thinking. It's, it's something that we can't quite grasp, but we know will have a lot of dividends, will create a lot of possibility in the future. So I see that the making market side of the enabling environment to be very, very important. And again, policy, institutions, trust are very important to, to do that. Second, let me move, move briefly to, to the assets and capabilities, because I think all three spoke to assets, it, be it human capital, be it physical capital, be it uh, financial inclusion or social and community capital. One of the big things that comes out of our own research at UNDP and thinking about income generation and poverty, uh, the dynamics of poverty, is that we find that the the motors that explain leaving poverty, which are mostly income and human capital uh, uh, assets, are different from the determinants that, uh, of falling back into poverty, which are usually physical capital and financial capital. So when we see this combination of dynamics of income generation, of labor market participation in informal market settings, what we need to think about is how do we create that slow construction of assets for some of the poorest and most difficult uh, scenarios in the world. So human, physical, financial, social will all be on the agenda. But as you all know, these are slow cumulative processes. And I'm also inspired by some of the, the, the examples that Matthew provided from Kiva, because what it's saying is that on the financial inclusion and with very granular interventions, we're able to maybe leapfrog through digital means at sometimes some of the issues that might take 10 or 15 years to construct, like ID systems and rights and access to services and so on. So I think that second feature, which is assets and capabilities, is, is truly uh, one, of the, one of the hardest things to do, but one of the most important. So let me move to the third issue, which is all of this is linked to the long run. It's not just about uh, getting out of this particular crisis, but moving to a new equilibrium. And we know that, that structural transformation is about shifts in productivity from low productivity to high productivity. But I think uh, there is some new news on this agenda as well. And I would, I would uh, flag our, our most recent human development report on the Anthropocene, because that report is quite interesting. It gives us a glimpse into the future, because it shows that there is no country in the world that has both high levels of human development, but low levels of carbon emission. That quadrant is actually empty. So what it's saying is that the future convergence is not going to be to the top, it's going to be towards the middle. Some countries have already spent up their carbon emissions budget, if you will, and some countries have a way to go. And as we meet, uh, we have to be thinking about well-being, prosperity, labor, income, and also basic services. So we'll have an agenda of moving up on the services and income, but we'll have an agenda of decoupling emissions from economic growth. That's the future structural transformation agenda within planetary boundaries. And I think what we just heard is that some of the most interesting cases in the world are actually coming from this context because it's showing us that the challenge of doing both is on the table. Structural transformation is productivity change, yes, but thinking about planetary boundaries, thinking about digital inclusion, new sources of productivity is also on the table. So I think uh, um, not to be uh, too sensationalist about this, but I think that when we think about fragility context, when we think about crisis in post-conflict settings, what we're seeing are glimpses of the future in this great transition to a decarbonized economy. The bumpy road ahead of us is not linear, it's recursive. So we need to learn to move from one equilibrium set to a new equilibrium set. 
in each of our country contexts. So I'll stop there, uh, Luca, but I just wanted to say thank you. I'm privileged to, to be able to, to, to listen to you all, but also uh, I think it sparks a lot of new ideas for all of us who are trying to see how this connects to LDCs, to middle-income countries, to SIDS, and to the challenges of development in each uh, development setting, which is quite unique and from which we will all learn. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, George, uh, for your very insightful uh, remarks. Uh, moving to a new equilibrium, this is what uh, collectively we're trying to do uh, as, as humanity, right? But uh, uh, we then have to work within the context of, of each country, within the context of, it, of, of their national priorities. And uh, as I said at the beginning, this is uh, fundamentally the ambition of UNDP, to be a partner in accompanying peoples and country in their uh, journey from uh, disequilibrium or, or, a, or a situation of fragility to a new uh, equilibrium where uh, both uh, uh, consideration of, of equity, of inclusion, of sustainability, uh, of resilience can be uh, uh, taken into account. Um, it is complex and UNDP, of course, uh, wants to do this in partnership with uh, a wide range of, of actors, of course, first and foremost, the national government, but also uh, national uh, non-governmental entities, private sector, uh, think tanks, uh, NGOs, and of course, uh, the, the partners within the UN system. So um, it's now uh, time to close the event. Uh, once again, uh, the uh, heartful thanks to the panelists for being with us uh, for 90 minutes. Uh, uh, thanks to George for being with us today. But I also want to uh, uh, thank uh, my team, in particular, Carlo, Ruiz, and Yuko Hirose for uh, really having uh, done the heavy lifting in organizing this event, as well as the uh, colleagues who are hosting us uh, in, the, in the platform uh, of DigiMentors. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, please stay tuned for more events on the development dialogue. And uh, uh, I wish you all a very uh, good day. Bye-bye from New York.